Okay, can you all hear me? Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the Broad and to um, our Focus on Rare Disease um, event for this year. My name is Anna Greca. I'm a physician scientist. Uh, I work at Brigham and Women's Hospital um, in um, at the Longwood side and here at the Broad um, as a scientist. And uh, this is the third year that we're organizing um, this event. Uh, it started three years ago. Uh, we wanted to commemorate um, uh, International Rare Diseases Day, which happens to be today. Uh, and we have done this event uh, for three years in a row. In the first year, we focused on uh, some rare cancers and uh, prion disease. Um, last year, we focused on a, a very uh, exciting new project at the Broad called the Rare Genomes Project. And uh, this year, um, I decided to bring the theme a little bit closer to home and uh, focus on rare kidney disease, um, which is uh, an area that uh, my group uh, particularly uh, works in. Um, so uh, the agenda for today, I'm just uh, here to uh, make a brief introduction. The agenda for today will be uh, to uh, present the wonderful exhibit that we have outside and afterwards uh, during the reception, you're welcome to go and admire the portraits. I will tell you a tiny uh, few words about it, but uh, Patricia Weltin is here to tell us more. So we will uh, talk a little bit about the exhibit, uh, which uh, we have for three years now had at the Broad uh, together with our celebration, our event. Um, and then we will uh, go into some presentations, uh, two very brief presentations from two scientists uh, in our group who are working on two different uh, rare kidney diseases and uh, therapies for how to treat them. Um, and then we will actually have our um, um, keynote speaker who is um, uh, a patient himself and someone who will tell you uh, all about living with rare kidney disease and his family's story, Richard Nelson. Um, so um, to get started, um, I would like to Introduce, introduce Patricia Weltin and to tell you that uh, Patricia and I connected about four years ago when I saw an article uh, about her um, uh, Beyond the Diagnosis exhibit uh, as a wonderful way to commemorate uh, you know, rare disease and basically to put a face, a true face, uh, the portrait of a child uh, to each of the 7,000 rare diseases that exist out there. That's her quest. Uh, she has done an amazing job growing this exhibit and it's gone international. She'll tell you perhaps a little more about it, but um, I asked her if I could have permission to show pictures of some of those portraits for one of the talks that I was giving. And that's how our connection started and here we are uh, more than three years later and uh, we're going strong and um, I think uh, this year the exhibit is the most portraits we've ever had at the Broad and we're so proud and happy to um, have them here. Um, and uh, Meryl Fink um, will be uh, introduced by Patricia and she will tell us about uh, her experience of using art as a way to uh, promote awareness for rare disease. Um, and uh, then we will go into the scientific program and I'll tell you more about that uh, closer to that time. So welcome again and uh, let's uh, have Patricia. Thank you, Anna. Uh, we're really, really excited to be back here for our third year at Broad, and um, I agree with Anna that this has been uh, this this show is spectacular. Um, uh, lots of new portraits. Uh, it keeps growing every year. Uh, we started with 17 portraits. Our first venue was Brown University. We now have over 100 portraits. Um, we are completely booked this month. Every portrait that we have is at a venue somewhere in this country. So um, this exhibit has really grown beyond um, anything that I could ever hoped and the impact that it's had, not just on uh, you know, the rare disease community, but on, on researchers and on uh, the medical community who engage with the, these portraits and are moved um, because you are able to connect with these children's humanity. And that was the whole point. Um, that's why we call it Beyond the Diagnosis. So we're really, really excited to be here. And uh, this year we painted a child with progeria, and that's why Merrill is here. Um, the portrait is, is absolutely stunning, um, and we're, we're so grateful to uh, be working with the Progeria Research Foundation. Um, excuse me. So Merrill joined uh, the Progeria Research Foundation in 2015, and she brings her experience as an attorney uh, to, to her work there. She's responsible for ensuring uh, the Progeria Research Foundation's financial growth, program de development, and day-to-day -day management. Um, we, uh, you know, I, I 
am familiar with the Progeria Re Research Foundation, not just because of the work you do, but because I'm originally from Rhode Island. So, uh, of course, you know, we know the connection to Rhode Island. So uh, I'd like to introduce Meryl Fink and have her tell you more about uh, Progeria. Thank you, Patricia, for that introduction and for all of your efforts to make uh, this exhibit, the Beyond the Diagnosis exhibit, a, a reality. I'm thrilled to be here at the Broad Institute today to speak to all of you and, and particularly to reach out to the medical and research community to help continue to build awareness uh, about progeria. Let's see. Oop. There we go. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar, progeria or Hutchinson-Guilford progeria syndrome is a rare, fatal genetic condition characterized by the appearance of accelerated aging in children. Um, while there are different forms of progeria, the classic type is known as Hutchinson-Guilford progeria syndrome, which was named after the doctors who first described it in England over 100 years ago, in 1886 by Dr. Jonathan Hutchinson and 1897 by Dr. Hastings Guilford. Children with progeria die of cardiovascular disease at an average age of 14 and a half years. Progeria is caused by a sporadic mutation in the lamin A gene. The lamin A gene, not surprisingly, produces the lamin A protein, uh, which is the structural scaffolding that holds the nucleus of a cell together. I realize I may be on shaky territory trying to speak science as a, as a non-scientist here, but I'm going to muddle through. Um, Researchers now believe that the defective lamin A protein that is produced in children with progeria is, makes the nucleus unstable, and that that cellular instability appears to lead to the, prog the process of premature aging in these children. Although they're born looking healthy, children with progeria um, begin to display many characteristics of accelerated aging within the first nine months of their lives. Some of the earliest signs of progeria are um, tightness of the skin, primarily starting with the, the skin on the abdomen, uh, failure to grow, failure to thrive, um, and a loss of body fat and hair. Um, all of the children have a remarkably similar appearance despite you know, differing ethnic backgrounds. Um, you might look at these two pictures and think that they are the same child, but they are not. Uh, this similarity in appearance actually helps us bring general awareness to the disease and gives physicians more information about what to look for when making a diagnosis. You'll see here, this, these, these pictures represent the progression of the disease over time. And again, not, these are all four separate children. Not this, not, none of them are the same. Um, I mentioned that progeria is rare. It's actually ultra rare. The estimate, the the. Uh, we estimate that there are between 350 and 400 children living with progeria worldwide at any one time. It affects approximately 1 in 20 million people. Um, diagnosis of the condition is key because we need to find these children in order to bring them help and the, the care and treatment. We've heard from parents that even though the diagnosis is devastating, it also brings with a sense of inf it brings information and hope. This is Zoe. This is all the same child. Um, Zoe was diagnosed with progeria at the age of three months, one of our earliest diagnoses. Um, and the story of her diagnosis is why awareness and education in the medical community is so crucial. Zoe's doctor was very astute. He recalled that he had seen something in the medical literature about progeria and recalled that it, it caused that distinctive wrinkling in the abdomen. And he noticed that wrinkling in Zoe, and that was what eventually led him to suspect that she had progeria. Um, this, uh, you'll see each one of these pins gives you a sense that we have children all over the world, currently 45 countries, and on every continent except Antarctica. Um, needing to reach out to these children, we want to make sure we're connecting with them and their families in their native languages. So we, our materials are available to them in, and we arrange for interpreters currently in 32 different languages. Um, and you can see that over time, uh, the Progeria Research Foundation was founded in 1999 and since the year 2000, you'll see the, the, the what I think is remarkable growth in the number of children that we have found throughout the world and the increased number of countries that we've been able to, to reach out to. Um, 
again, this is a, a brief um, a depiction of the various programs that we run at the Progeri Research Foundation, but they all begin with finding the child. All of our programs are based around the children. Um, we can't, and then we build from there. Uh, we've created a database to collect the medical records for children with progeria from all over the world. With this information, we look at every aspect of the medical care that's been given to these children, and we do a statistical analysis to see what treatments have worked for maintaining quality of life and what treatments have not worked. Um, we also use their medical records to understand more about the basis of disease, which then serves as a springboard to doing um, preclinical research into progeria. And ultimately, what we're trying to do, oh, we've also developed uh, a diagnostics testing program. Once the, the gene mutation was isolated, we were able to develop uh, a diagnostics testing program, which means we have earlier diagnoses, fewer misdiagnoses, and earlier medical intervention for these children. All of the programs are leading to the clinical trials. We've uh, funded, the PRF has funded four clinical trials to date. There's one currently going on here at Boston Children's Hospital, and the clinical trials are our best, uh, best ways. You know, that's, that's going to ultimately be where we find treatments and a cure. I hope you'll all have a chance uh, to see Megan's portrait. Um, that's Megan. She is an amazing young woman, and the portrait does an, an incredible job of, of capturing her spirit beautifully. Um, we are ex so excited about the potential impact of this exhibit to help us raise awareness and to educate the medical and research community. That, that's something we're not able to do as much as we would like. As a nonprofit organization, we don't always have the resources to attend medical conferences throughout the country and throughout the world. Um, this exhibit does that for us. This exhibit brings Megan's story and other children's stories into the all-important medical and research community, um, which we wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Uh, it, the exhibit is bringing children out of the background bringing them to the forefront, and literally making them visible. Nothing could be more important than that. So I'll leave you that, and thank you very much. Thank you, Meryl. This is fantastic, and it really speaks to the theme for um, uh, all of these events that we've uh, had here on Rare Disease Day, which is especially for rare diseases, I think it's true for all diseases, but especially for rare diseases, the partnership between the doctors, the scientists, and the patients is critical to find the answer because, um, you know, when patients are uh, so far and few between, uh, in order to, you know, understand something about the progression of the disease, to assemble patients who are clinical trial ready, in order for um, ideas to be tested down the road, it becomes so important to be connected to the patients. Uh, and so that's something that's uh, a theme for uh, across the board in rare diseases, and uh, it's so wonderful to hear your efforts in uh, progeria. So um, with that in mind, we're going to move into the more scientific part of the, uh, of the program. Uh, we have two speakers. Uh, the first one is Yiming Zhu. He's a postdoctoral fellow in my group. Uh, he uh, is originally from China, trained um, in Japan, and uh, has done some remarkable work in the lab, which was recently uh, published uh, in a high-impact journal. And he will tell us a little bit, not so much about the science, but about the story. How did we, as scientists, come up with the ideas that we tested in the lab and what came out of that? And um, it's about a, a, a new a hope for a new treatment for a rare uh, kidney disease called nephrotic syndrome. Uh, so Yiming will tell you uh, more about that. So Yiming. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Anna, for your kind introduction. So I'm very uh, glad to be here to present our recent work. Uh, uh, so my present tit uh, presentation title is Precision, uh, Precision Medicine for FFGS, uh, TRP C5 Inhibitors. Uh, so first, I would like to give a brief introduction about the kidney. So the kidney are the largest uh, secretory organs in our body. It filters like uh, 120 quarts of uh, plasma every day and uh, generate one uh, to two quarts of urine. And here, it, oh, sorry. So here is a structure of the, the kidney. And you can see it's uh, separated into the glomeruli and nephron. And I would not go into too much detail. So first I would like to show uh, my story with uh, the rare, one rare kidney disease called FFGS. Uh, like 18 years ago when I was still uh, Chinese, uh, when, when I was still uh, in China, 
uh, in uh, high school, I like watching NBA basketball. And I guess uh, many of, uh, of you know this uh, uh, professional basketball player, Alonzo Zo Morning. And uh, uh, at uh, uh, two, uh, 2000, uh, after the uh, Olympic Games, Alonzo Morning uh, uh, came back uh, with a gold medal. And uh, he uh, felt extremely tired, and he, uh, he found some edema in his legs. And he got like very, uh, you know, he, he, go, he went to see the doctor, and then he, he was very surprised to be diagnosed with uh, the, this rare kidney disease called FFGS. And, and then the, the later the story was like he got a kidney transplantation one year after, and he uh, fight back to the NBA, uh, 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 and then he won the uh, one um, NBA championship uh, at two, uh, 2006. And and that that time I don't know like uh, uh, so uh, I gonna study so much about this disease in the future. So this is a fact about the FFGS. So five out of like ten thousand people, and many of them are children, uh, have the FFGS associated with nephrotic syndrome. And this is a typical phase of the people with nephrotic syndrome. And this is because the breakdown of the kidney filtration uh, barrier. And, and, and the water and the waste uh, cannot uh, uh, excrete uh, from uh, our body. And uh, uh, approximately 1,500 patients with FFGS undergo transplantation every year in the U.S. right now. And uh, with uh, 30 to 50 percent risk of the disease coming back in the, in the kidney. And here is showing the... Uh, uh, structure of the uh, normal kidney and the kidney af uh, af uh, affected by the FFGS. So the FFGS, the full name is focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, and uh, literally it's indicating some uh, kidney section, uh, some section of the kidney filter have scars, and the cause can be primary and uh, be uh, because of some uh, genetic mutation or some unknown reason, uh, and, it, and it can also be the secondary to some uh, uh, virus infection, obesity, diabetes, and high blood pressure. And currently, there is no cure for this uh, FFGS. And uh, some uh, 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 patient responds to the high dose of steroid, but uh, many of the patients, they are steroid resistant. So uh, the only thing they can do is uh, get the kidney transplantation. And this is our recent work uh, uh, published last year, and we found like a new uh, a potential new treatment for FG FFGS targeting TRPC5 uh, uh, M channel, and we're using uh, rats uh, expressing the human uh, and uh, uh, G protein coupled receptor uh, angiotensin, and then we found like these rats will develop like a clinical uh, uh, FFGS, and uh, by targeting this TRPC5 channel using an uh, uh, inhibitor, we uh, can reduce the protein urea level and the preserve the protocytes uh, in uh, this disease model. So hopefully in the uh, coming uh, uh, next uh, uh, five to 10 years, we will develop the more uh, drugs targeting these pathways and uh, do some uh, clinical studies in the future. And here is uh, the strategy, how we can develop the kidney-specific therapeutics from uh, uh, using the resources from three uh, different institutes, Harvard Medical School, uh, mainly the resources starting basic science and Brigham Women Hospital, mainly using the resources of translational uh, research, and uh, the, <clears throat> the greater resource of the genomics and the therapeutics from Broad uh, Institute of MIT and Harvard. So hopefully uh, in the next uh, uh, a few years, we can understand the FFGS by breaking down uh, the uh, uh, big uh, disease into small pieces and pinpoint what is uh, uh, causes for this uh, rare kidney disease. And here, uh, allow me to uh, acknowledgement and uh, Phil and I did many uh, animal work and the Moran and Fan, uh, uh, Sue and Fan did a lot of like in vitro experiments and all the other lab members support me uh, during this uh, excellent project. So thank you very much. save questions for later, uh, so we'll move on to the next talk for now, and then, you know, we'll open it up uh, in a bit. So the next speaker is uh, Moran Levitt-Bella. Uh, she's also a postdoctoral fellow in our group, 
and she's working on another uh, very rare kidney disease uh, called the MAC1 associated kidney disease. Um, this is a project that we are, uh, have been working on here at the Broad for some time. And Moran will tell you about some uh, ideas about this disease and you know, we, we think we're on a good track for, uh, uh, for treatment for this disease as well. So, Moran. Oh, I should mention, sorry, I should mention Moran uh, hails from Israel originally, I forgot to say that, uh, where she did um, all of her work prior to joining our group. And she's, um, she's uh, one of the prestigious Broad uh, Israeli Science Foundation fellows uh, here uh, in the lab. So, Moran. <laughs> So thank you, Anna, and thank you uh, for this opportunity to present. Um, oh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, so in the last three years, I've been working on a genetic, rare genetic kidney disease that is called mac one associated kidney disease. Um, before I start getting into the details um, telling you about this disease, I would like to start with a uh, um, few details about the function of the kidney. So as Iming already mentioned, the major function of the kidney is to filter our blood. Um, so our blood is actually contains a lot of toxins and, uh, oh, sorry, um, and um, waste that is found um, in our body. And unless it is removed, it can affect most of our organs in the body. So the, key, the organ that's supposed to prevent this from, ha from um, happening is, um, are the kidneys. And how does it do it? So every day, an enormous amount of blood is entering the kidney. And when it enters the kidney, it meets a very complex system of tubules. And their function is actually to separate all these good components of the blood from all these bad toxins and waste that is found in the blood. They dump all these bad components in the, the urine, and so therefore we are being left with all the good components um, getting back into our circulation and feeding all of our organs. So this is what happens um, in a case when we have a kidney um, that is healthy and normal. In MAC1 kidney disease, what happens is the system of the tubules is being damaged, and therefore it can no longer filter that, the blood that is entering the kidney. So the result is a blood that contains waste and toxin that goes back into the circulation to feed all the organs in our body. And basically, when our kidney are failed to function, eventually all the organs in our body will fail as well. And this is what will happen to a patient that has MAC1 kidney disease unless there will be an intervention that will be made. As I mentioned as well, um, MAC1 kidney disease is a genetic disorder, which means that it can pass through the generation. And the way um, it does that is through an autosomal dominant manner. What does that mean? So each one of us has two copies of most of the genes in our body. One that we got from each of our parents. This person has two healthy normal copies of the MAC1 gene, which means that this person is a healthy individual. This person, un unfortunately, has one copy that is healthy and normal. However, the other MAC1 copy has the mutation, um, um, and actually it is sufficient to have one mutated copy in order to be affected and have the MAC1 kidney disease. Now what happens in the next generation? The mother in, a, in this family will pass on one of her two healthy um, copies of the MAC1 gene, while the father in this family can pass on either one of the, um, um, the, the one copy which is normal, resulting in two of his kids that will be healthy. However, it can all, there are 50% that he will pass on the um, affected, the diseased copy of the gene, and that will result in 50% of the kids in this family um, being affected and having the MAC1 kidney disease. 
This is actually the two main features that MAC-1 kidney disease patients have, meaning a family history that is needed because it is a genetic disorder, and a damage that will be done to the tubules. As you can imagine, these two features are not very specific. And therefore, nephrologists will have a very hard time to diagnose a new patient that come with these features with this disease. So um, let's say a patient was diagnosed with um, MAC1 kidney disease. What are his options? What are the solutions that a nephrologist can offer to these patients? Um, so the first option is to go on a dialysis. And if you know um, a person that is going on a dialysis, you are probably familiar with the fact that it is really not an ideal option. The average life expectancy for patients um, that are on dialysis is only five years. And in addition to that, during this time, the patient has to go to the hospital three times a week and to be connected to this machine that basically is doing the, what the kidney is supposed to do to filter the blood, and it has to be done um, during, um, on average, three hours. So as you can imagine, it has a very great impact on the quality of life of patients on dialysis. The other option, which is much better, is a kidney transplantation. In that case, the average life expectancy is much higher. However, as you probably know, the availability and compatibility of um, organs of kidneys is very limited. So as you can see, there is a lot of space for research and um, um, new discoveries in this area. And this is when the MAC1 team actually took this project and started working on this. When um, the MAC1 group at the Broad started working on this project, they have few aims in mind. The first aim that is very basic and very obvious was to find the gene that is responsible for this disease. The second aim was actually to find a better diagnosis for this disease. Currently, as you saw, the um, two features that are um, common for MAC1 patients are very general. And um, it is required to find a diagnosis that will be very accurate and very precise that we can offer the patients. The third aim is to find the biological mechanism that is responsible for this disease. And using this information, information, of course, the ultimate goal is to find a treatment eventually that will be much more appropriate than the current solution that we have to offer to our patients. So let's start with the first goal. So as I said, the basic thing was to find what is the genetic cause of the disease. And even to the broad, it wasn't such a trivial task. As now um, we know that this gene was actually hiding in a, um, in a very elusive part of the genome that was considered to be a blind spot. So this is why it was very hard to find this gene, the cause of the disease. However, eventually with the great minds working on this project, they managed to find the gene, as you already know, to be MAC1. And shortly afterward, the disease was called MAC1 kidney disease upon discovering um, this gene. So MAC1 is actually a protein that is called mucin-1 that is found on the surface um, of the tubular cells. And what it does is it basically protects the cells. It is mucus. It protects the cells from being damaged. The second goal, as I mentioned, was to have to develop a diag diagnosis for the disease. And, um, um, and that was actually happened um, thanks to the broad sequencing facility that managed to develop a very sophisticated assay in which upon receiving a sample of DNA from a patient that is candidate to have MAC1 kidney disease, they can actually test whether it has the healthy copy of the MAC1 or the mutated copy of the MAC1, and in this way to precisely and very accurately to diagnose a patient with the disease. In this way, we can offer um, different family members that would like to know whether they carry the disease or not, we can offer them this diagnosis. But not only that, before having this diagnosis, whenever a one family member would be diagnosed with, um, with the disease, 
Um, um, so basically, there are um, chances that another family member would like to donate a kidney um, for him. However, without knowing whether another family member um, has the disease or not, he cannot donate a kidney. In this way, when we have um, a precise diagnosis of the disease, we can offer also the um, possibility for our patient to decide whether they can um, donate or not a kidney. Um, the next mission was to find what is the biological mechanism that is responsible for the disease. So we know that MAC1 is the gene that is causing this disease, but how? How will that um, result in the damage of the tubular kidney and eventually to the fail, uh, failure of um, the organ. In order to do that, we had three different models. Um, the first model we developed was a cellular model in which we took cells from a kidney of a patient, and in this way we can look at these cells, we can study them, we can study what is going on on these cells, and we can learn better about the mechanism of the disease. The second model that we developed is what we called kidney organoids. And what does that mean is that we can take these cells and we can grow them in a very specific environment so they can actually um, perform and uh, generate a small kidney, a small organoid, a small kidney that can grow on a dish. And in this way, we can actually study the more complex um, mechanism of the disease. The last model that we developed is an animal model in which we engineered a mouse to express the mutated uh, version of the gene. And in this way, we actually have an animal that has this uh, mutated protein, and we can study what is going on on the entire animal. Using these three systems, we managed to gain a lot of understanding about the disease, but due to the time limitation, I won't go over our findings. But using these findings, we could actually learn better how the cells are being damaged and how the kidney is eventually being failed. And now the next question is, of course, whether we can reverse it, whether we can uh, find a cure, find a compound that can eventually restore the kidney function and have a kidney that can manage to filter the blood um, that will come into the circulation. In order to do that, we used um, um, all of the um, uh, finest um, technology that the broad has to offer, and we asked, actually performed um, a drug screen in which we tested many drugs to see whether they can perform this task. And while this is an ongoing research, um, um, we are, I would like to share with you that we are actually pursuing um, several very interesting leads, and I hope that this time next year, we will be able to share with you the results on this regard. So to summarize, I've shared with you today our journey that started less than 10, 10 years ago when we didn't know much about MAC1 kidney disease. And during this very short time, we managed to accomplish many of our aims. And hopefully in the very near future, we will also manage to accomplish our last and ultimate goal. So first of all, thank you. And I would like to thank Anna that is leading these um, efforts that are being made but by um, a very good teamwork and by many uh, people that are contributing um, to this work. Um, and especially to Masha, Monica, and Eva in this project. Thank you very much. Um, wonderful, Moran, thank you. So as you can see, first it takes a village to get a lot of this work done. Uh, it's really a team effort. Science is a team sport. Um, and uh, uh, the other thing that uh, comes as a theme from all of this uh, work that uh, both Yi Ming and Moran presented is um, that uh, nothing can be accomplished without close uh, partnership, not only between us, the scientists and the physicians, but also the patients. So one of the key things in uh, solving MAC1 kidney disease, you know, it's... Uh, kind of a small story, but when I first uh, took over the therapeutics uh, approach to this project, Eric Lander, who, whose lab had worked on finding the gene mutation, said to me, well, you know, we, we only know about 20 people around the world who, who have this disease. And I said, 
that just can't be true, you know, and we certainly need to figure out how we can, you know, find more people, like in the, in the progeria uh, situation. And so we started an international registry with a number of clinicians around the world who continue to be our collaborators. And um, at this point, we have about 800 patients, 800 patients in the registry, and it's growing. And I think that we're <laughs> going to hit them many thousands by the time we're able to deploy, uh, you know, this... Uh, this test that is uh, specific to the Broad. So we offer this genetic test that the Broad can do in this dark corner of the human genome where this mutation lies. We offer it for free to anyone around the world who would like to be tested. And so we're hoping that this way we can uh, continue to increase the numbers in our registry and uh, continue to build uh, our understanding of the disease and also ultimately uh, deploy a treatment. So uh, it's really a wonderful partnership. So speaking of partnerships with patients, um, this is now the time to introduce the keynote speaker for the evening. Uh, this is uh, Richard Nelson, uh, who actually really comes, the connection to him comes from uh, Makwan kidney disease. It comes from the idea of approaching patients uh, or patients approaching clinicians and, and scientists and being a part of the process. And so Richard and his family, and you will hear uh, about their story, uh, have become connected with us um, and have been partners with us along this journey of trying to, you know, not only understand Makwan kidney disease, but also eventually find a cure for it. Um, I will not speak, uh, you know, he's a very accomplished man in his own right, but I will not make a long introduction, but rather allow for Richard to speak in his own words and tell you about uh, his family story. So, Richard. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Ran, that was a uh, great introduction to our ultra rare disease. Use in one, and now MKD for short. Uh, thank you, Anna, Dr. Anna Greca, and your team for your absolute resolve to find a treatment and a cure for our ultra rare mucin one kidney disease with 800 patients and about 160 or so families worldwide. Uh, it's an incredible privilege to present to your brilliant uh, Broad Institute colleagues and community guests. Uh, last week, the last two weeks, we've really had a, 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 another remarkable experience watching the Olympics, but there was one moment that stood out more than any other that created history. And I want to share uh, Jesse uh, Diggins, who did something in the history of uh, her sport that has never been accomplished by an American. In fact, Americans have only medaled once in the history of the Olympics. Here we go, it's on for gold. Norway, Sweden and the USA. It's her turn to ask some questions of Norway and Sweden. This is a mighty final. Into the stadium they come. A couple of hundred meters to go, it's anybody's. It doesn't look like Fala can do it for the Norwegians. It's Sweden and the United States. Stride for stride, push for push. Who's it going to be? Nelson or Diggins coming down to the line. And the United States has done it from Sweden and Norway. Oh, what a performance from Jess Diggins. History for the United States. Achieving the impossible is possible. When you have a rare disease, this is your only choice. As improbable as it seems, your research patients and their families are eager to help you do the impossible. Today is a once in a lifetime opportunity to share the Nelson family 30 year search for a tangible answers for a disease that causes half of your offspring to have renal failure. 24 years ago, I jumped into being a patient advocate for a genetic disease I thought I had until three years ago when the team here and at Wake Forest discovered that my three siblings, myself, and a large number of our 21 children have mucin-1 kidney disease. 
Even when impossible rare diseases appear to be impossible to solve, I've found that first, hope, and second, absolute resolve make all the difference in the lives we live. After all, only we have the choice of the life we're going to live. This core philosophy has changed my life. 31 years ago, my energy level dropped dramatically and unexpectedly. I was very active, only 38, a father of three young boys, four, two, and six months old. Through an ultrasound, I was diagnosed with the well-known polycystic kidney disease, PKD. In researching my family's history for my nephrologist, I began questioning, number one, why had my father died so young, age 43? Why was my father an only child? And why had he lost his father, my grandfather, when he was just five years old? For context, my father was my hero and accomplished a great deal in his short life. He was a highly decorated World War II Marine Corps fighter pilot in the Solomon Islands and Guadalcanal, and upon his return from war, achieved his great dream of becoming a surgeon. As an 11-year-old, my dad was bigger than life. I thought he could do anything. Suddenly, after practicing as a surgeon for only five years, he passed away at age 43 leaving my angel mother to raise us six children, ages 16 to 3. For decades, we all had understood that Dad's death had been the result of a fungal ear infection contracted in the South Pacific, which eventually shut down his kidneys. There was never a hint that this was a genetic kidney disease. And yet, upon my kidneys failing, I started to ask questions about our family history, even visiting our ancestral cemetery in rural southern Idaho. Looking back four generations to my great-grandfather, his children, and my father, there was a clear trend. Many of them died in their 30s. Clearly, the family lore about an ear infection was incorrect. And this illness, which I then thought was PKD, had been around for generations. All of this was overwhelming for me, just 38 and my young family, as I faced the prospects of the same fate as my father and grandfather's. And yet my personal story would take a very fortunate turn. 27 years ago, after four years of waiting, I received a kidney transplant a kidney from a 17-year-old girl in upstate New York who died of a brain aneurysm. It was a rare six-antigen match, perfect match. I immediately felt energized upon waking up in the recovery room. Of course, back then, live donors were exceedingly rare. There were only cadaveric donors for the small pool of 19,000 awaiting on the national kidney list. Today, nearly 100,000 people are waiting for a transplant, kidney transplant, for a variety of reasons. This country and the world have never needed your hard work and innovation more. After my transplant in 1991, it was a lean time for me and my family this was long before the Affordable Care Act, and I'd lost my private medical insurance after my transplant. As a result, I interviewed with the Governor's Office of Economic Development for an appointment with fantastic medical insurance. But uh, it was a much lower paying position. I wasn't sure I wanted to abandon the much more lucrative private sector but I'll never forget the morning that I went to the final interview when my dear bride 
Karen suggested her great concern. You need to be more serious about getting insurance for our family. And now that we have these three little boys, please go interview and get an offer from this board, and then you can decide if you want the job. In her view, our little family needed a miracle uh, to have great health insurance again. Fifty people had applied for that governor's appointment, and I could see in the final round that they weren't interested in me. Uh, So recognizing that, I needed to turn the dynamics around to get an offer, as I'd been challenged by my dear uh, Karen. I asked, would you like to know the real reason I'm interviewing for this position? This caught their attention, holding out my hand, uh, which was shaking due to the high level of immunosuppressants. I continued, as you can see, my hand is shaking. It's not because I'm nervous. Rather, it's because I had a transplant three months ago. That causes me to shake. And I got pushed off my insurance, and I'm not insurable. Since you have the best insurance and largest pool in the state, if you hire me, I'll do a great job. That got their attention. Surprisingly, they took empathy, maybe even sympathy on me as transplants were not very common then, and they hired me. While my initial experience with kidney failure was difficult, it proved to be the best outcome in my family. Of the six children my parents had, four of us had been affected with kidney failure. My brother Doug, the same year I was diagnosed, and my two sisters in the decade that followed. They have all had very difficult experiences with multiple failed transplants and years and years of dialysis. My dear sister, Marcia Ann, passed away just this past December after being on dialysis for 20 years. Noted that the average was about five years. And an extreme is about 10 My friend Dean Kamen knows a lot about this. As it became clear that this was a disease that affected our extended family, not just me, my older brother, called me and gave me a challenge. He said, you know a lot about kidney disease, but we really don't know anything about our family disease. I want to put you on scholarship to go meet the world's best researchers so our family can help be a part of the solution. As a result, Steve underwrote my trips to 10 polycystic kidney disease annual conferences over the next 15 years. The first was in Scottsdale, Arizona in 1994. I'll never forget getting on the plane with no clue what to expect my brother had the, uh, was the visionary and it paid for me to go. My sister had total faith that the family needed me to be there and told me she'd be praying that I could connect with the right experts. I felt a little unequal to the task, but felt absolute resolve to find answers. That first day, I optimistically marched to the front of the large room to sit down on the front row and met two distinguished researchers, both internationally renowned thought leaders and clinicians known as the best researchers in their field. Dr. Vicente Torres, the driven head of nephrology, the Mayo Clinic, and Dr. Ted Steinman, who's here today, professor at Harvard Medical School a globally sought-after clinician and researcher. At that first conference and in the decade that followed, an abundance of hope was restored in my life's outlook, energy and ability to affect change on behalf of our family. I became part of a community of those with the same disease and was able to uh, contribute to the uh, conversation 
that these remarkable researchers and clinicians were having. It was through these conferences that we were able to develop relationships that led our family to the world's best to be studied, to the Mayo Clinic, to Wake Forest, and ultimately here to the Broad Institute. And I am incredibly thankful for your research and Anna for your leading the effort. Thank you very, very much. This all came about by a generous older brother without this disease. He became the acting patriarch of our family after dad died and had the foresight to encourage our family to become experts as best we could in our disease and become part of the solution. It led me to dedicate more of my time in the leadership of the National Kidney Foundation of Utah and the National PKD Foundation Board in Kansas City. I was driven not only by seeing my three siblings face debilitating illness in their lives, but the prospects of my children and nieces and nephews having to endure the same. I have found the impossible is possible. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. It is the only thing that ever has, Margaret Mead. I love that. I'll give you a terrific example of how absolute resolve in our rare disease world within one of the most difficult, and I'll add most dysfunctional organizations, uh, gets results. The United States Congress. In 1998, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, or GINA, had near unanimous support in both the House and the Senate. But why hadn't it become law a decade later in 2008? How could that be with all the good it would accomplish? After all, this was the legislation that prevented employers from discriminating against people who had knowledge of their potential genetic diseases or disorders. At the time, I had a role as chairman of uh, Technology Councils of North America, uniting the voice of 42 tech councils, like the one I headed in Utah from 1999 until my retirement six months ago. I got to know members of Congress and other influencers there in Washington as I frequently traveled to Washington, D.C. in my leadership role, representing 18,000 U.S. tech companies. Also, I was an engaged patient advocate for the PKD Foundation and agreed to facilitate a very special meeting between, the founda between foundation leaders and U.S. Senator Bob Bennett from my home state, who had just discovered he had RPKD disease. The foundation arranged to have Dr. Ted Steinman, their lead medical congressional spokesperson, fly from Boston to, to Washington, along with its uh, CEO. Also present were uh, Senator Bennett's wife and his recently diagnosed daughter, who was at William and Mary's, who uh, was seeking treatment for her PKD. Dinner was at the Monaco on a snowy night in February 2008, exactly 10 years ago, close to the Senate's Russell office building. There were two actionables that I proposed. First was easy. Dr. Steinman offered to be their daughter's nephrologist at Beth Israel Deaconess and invited her to join in his PKD research studies. The second had a string on it. I shared, as you know, Senator Bennett, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act is one vote short of passing in the Senate. For the past decade, your colleague, Tom Coburn from Oklahoma, has put a hold on the legislation under the Senate rules. I continued, if you agree, 
we need you to persuade him to withdraw draw his hold. Given the tremendous good that this would do for patients and researchers in America, he agreed. To add insurance, because I'm a realist first, <laughs> I often call myself a pragmatist as I've had to deal with politics. I'm not a D and I'm not an R. I've got to get real things done. The industry or the uh, unique rare disease area that I represent. To add insurance to our efforts, I reached out to Senator Bennett's close friend and colleague from Utah, Senator Warren Hatch, and shared that Bob had PKD and needed his help with getting Gina passed. I was in the right place with the right relationships, both influential United States senators. What was impossible for many years was finally passed into law three months later. It takes absolute resolve with trusted relationships to change the world. This is an integral role for patient advocates and our foundations to overcome barriers, bringing help and hope to desperate and deserving patients. As mentioned, my transplant uh, story highlights the best outcomes for this complex and difficult genetic kidney disease. Three of my siblings haven't, have had a much more difficult road. My younger sister has had two cadaveric uh, transplants and is doing quite well and lives in Chicago, but has six children at risk. My younger brother, has had two transplants and is again on dialysis after 26 years and now has heart failure, brought on in part by the drugs that he took to prevent transplant rejection. My dear older sister, Marcia Ann, has lived the most inspiring life story, even though she was on dialysis, as I mentioned, for 20 years and just died in December at the age of 71. Her life of suffering tethered to a hemodialysis machine three times a week, three, more like four hours, and more like hooking up, it's more like four and a half to five hours you're in that center, has been absolutely, could have been absolutely miserable for her and her family. And yet, in spite of her unrelenting physical challenges, she chose to be a light and a positive influence as we celebrated her life of bringing light into many other lives. Dear Marcian was all about caring for others and inspiring us to find the silver lining in life. For our family, it's been all about finding light and hope. Three years ago, I was contacted by Dr. Peter Harris, head geneticist in nephrology at the uh, Mayo Clinic, saying he'd made a mistake about our family's disease. Someone with his distinguished credentials from Oxford, then recruited to the Mayo, doesn't often make or admit to a mistake. During 20 years of actively volunteering in their NIH studies, our family of four siblings with this mutant gene that you were studying here and we didn't know about it for a lot of those years, along with my five children and their 16 cousins gained much hope and confidence that there would be a treatment for our PKD-like disease. Then there was a complete pivot in our pursuit of a treatment. Dr. Harris had read a paper by Dr. Tony Blyer, PI at uh, Wake Forest Medical Center, and leading edge researchers here at the Broad, who had published their breakthrough discovery of a complex, ultra-rare disease they initially named MUC1. Since we didn't have one of the three genes that uh, was defined in the PKD family. Dr. Harris thought our family disease may be this MUC1 disease. 
and introduced us to the folks at Wake Forest and here at the Broad to pursue our search. While this community of families with our ultra-rare disease is still extremely small, to us it means so much to finally feel like we are closer to answers than ever before. We absolutely are resolved as a family to do whatever it takes to support you in your noble, in our noble, and life-changing effort. Shortly after connecting with Dr. Greca and Dr. Blyer, the Nelson family huddled up as a family to talk about the future. Now that we knew we were going to have many affected by this muck one disease. Dr. Greca has been extremely kind and generous with her engagement to our large family. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. For example, at the Nelson family reunion in 2016, celebrating my father's 100th birthday, if he had been there, Anna put together a 14-minute video and spoke to us as if, as, if, as if she was actually there visiting with us. Uh, in a cabin on the shore of uh, beautiful Bear Lake in northern Utah, with over a hundred family members there, she shared her absolute resolve of, quote, aggressively pursuing a treatment and a cure. The next day, the reunion moved north, eight miles to the tiny cemetery in St. Charles, Idaho, also on the shore of that beautiful lake. Our ultra-rare disease was brought into laser focus by visiting eight Nelson family headstones. It was noticed, noted that four had died in their 30s. My grandfather, Andrew Nelson, can see, and two of his siblings and his father, Rasmus. For the first time, that experience brought home the dramatic reality to our 21 collected children of how their, ch their lives and their health may and will likely be challenged. They are the next generation to experience our rare mucin-1 kidney disease, yet fortunately, most have a real hope for a full and healthy life because of you and many others. Having lived with this rare disease for over uh, 31 years, our, our MKD uh, community should feel great hope for a world of growing transplantable kidneys, therapies that can slow or prevent disease progression, and better safety nets with more options for in-home dialysis, not dialysis centers like Dean Kamen is leading the global charge on. Thank you for being the brilliant scientists and inventors creating this new world. So where do we go from here? After two decades of unifying and building two substantial tech communities, my advice to uh, create greater hope and absolute resolve in the hundreds of rare disease communities represented here that you're studying and researching, my advice is trusted relationships are absolutely everything. We have just founded, and this is an announcement today, the Rare Kidney Disease Foundation as a result of Dr. Anna Greca's challenge to the Nelson family in October when we were here. Become patient advocates in our ultra rare disease cause. The foundation's purpose is to build trusted relationships too. Find the next thousand 
MKD patients through technology and social media, to increase patience so that you can study, do your research, and find new ways to augment the Broad's superior research to accelerate finding that treatment and a cure in a reasonable timeline. And for many more rare diseases, I want to give an example of trusted relationships are everything. I invited some of my colleagues to listen in or come today, like Dr. Steinman and Dean Kamen. Good news, I got a, a note from the president of the American Association of Kidney Patients, Paul Conway. Paul and I were on the PKD board together. He doesn't have PKD, he has a rare disease. And when he saw that, he shot me a note and then he followed it up with it today. Paul's the uh, president of that association. And he said, I want you to know today I sent out the announcement of your new foundation and what the Broad is doing to our 60,000 patients. So our new foundation has got its work cut out for it and we'll need your help, Anna and others. But it's a, a great example of what we can do together when you unify in a cause. I've been motivated by my dear sister's suffering on dialysis and death, my two struggling siblings, especially my five children, which my son is here today, Cameron, who completed his uh, medical work here at uh, Beth Israel Deaconess and as a fellow over here at uh, Boston Children, who guides me and tries to help me with the science side of this. Uh, but especially, I'm concerned about those five children and their 16 cousins. A principal reason, I recently re, uh, retired from a role that I absolutely loved for 18 years, was to pivot and to help find a treatment and to be part of the Broad's efforts and Paul's and many others. I've got the cycles now for the first time in my life, gotten off of the workaholic track, and this is my cause. Uh, looking at my five children and four grandchildren, Cameron's children, it's an absolute, it's my absolute resolve that they won't have to endure what my siblings and my father have. As I look at you and your brilliant work, I'm optimistic and confident in a bright future. Huge, uh, see, as I conclude, a huge thanks to Dr. Anna Rekka and your remarkable team and my great other colleagues and mentors like Ted Steinman. Huge thanks for your confidence in the Nelson family to lead out as rare disease advocates with our new foundation. I look forward with great hope and absolute resolve to achieving the impossible together. After all, never doubt what a small group of thoughtful, committed, I've taken some liberties here, committed scientists, and advocates can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Thank you very much. Richard, thank you. This was fantastic. Very inspiring um, to hear all of this. And congratulations on the launch of the new foundation. This is wonderful news. Um, we were going to take some questions at the end for anyone who was up here speaking today. Uh, any questions from the audience? And I think we have a couple of mics, or we can also uh, run them up. Uh, oh, Shannon is back there with the mic. Any questions at all? I've got one. Anything that as you long have... as I'm up here, I'm going to take a look. You bit. have a question. <laughs> Dr. Greca. Okay. So what is the future of 
Mucin one look like? You're at the forefront. I come back, I get these amazing reports. It it's not going incrementally. It's really moving well, we, forward. We have, we have and what's working. the timeline? Ah, give, yes. us, give us, give us, and I time. asked Ted Steinman many years ago that same question in Scottsdale. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, we, we are a big team and we're working very hard on this problem. Um, and uh, we're definitely very determined. Um, I don't want to make promises that I might have to break because science sometimes moves fast, sometimes moves slower. Uh, I think we're on a good track and we have great leads, as Moran said. Uh, especially one that we are uh, really pursuing and hope to uh, be able to develop further over the next year or two. Um, we are uh, very hopeful that, you know, in the next few years we will be able to put something into patients. And I think, you know, barring any unforeseen circumstances, which can always happen when you're doing these kinds of programs, uh, I'm feeling very good about our chances. And I think, uh, you know, having you as partners is going to help uh, to rally uh, the patients to you know, the uh, new ideas that we have to the uh, small clinical trials that we hope to launch. Um, and then, you know, whatever we learn from those, we'll keep building on until we get to, uh, to the answer. So, and we're leaving sort of no stone unturned. So we are really uh, working with uh, the idea of using small molecules, the idea of doing um, even more radical things like correcting the mutation using CRISPR technology, uh, a large component of which was uh, invented and developed here at Broad. So we are going to think about every solution possible to this rare uh, genetic disease, as well as countless others, of course, uh, which uh, many scientists uh, in these buildings are working on. So um, we're working really hard, as hard as we can, we to, make this, uh, to make this happen. Ted. I would just like to make one brief comment. Richard personifies the 10 most important two-letter words in the English language. If it is to be, it is up to me. And that's what Richard personifies. <laughs> Thank you, Ted. That's wonderful. Thank you. We are very lucky to have uh, this partnership. I think, uh, you know, it makes a big difference for being able to uh, make progress. And actually, Paul Conway, I met him, and I have had discussions about his rare disease, and I'm so glad that he's engaged because uh, I think we can help there as well. So I think that's really great. Yes, Tony. Tony Johnson. Um, that was a great presentation. Thank you. I'm interested in the causes of Mark one Is it one genetic mutation or are there multiple? And are there more severe and less severe forms? Brian, do you want to answer? But you need to be at a mic. There's one right there. Oh, you have one. Yeah. Because our friends from home on Facebook can't hear us unless yeah. we have a mic. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. So, yeah, actually, um, currently we know about the Mach 1 kidney disease. The only, like, the gene that is being the cause of the disease is Mach 1. Um, there are several mutations that can be done in order to. Um, kind of alter the gene and then uh, resulting in the disease, but currently we know that it's only the Mach 1. Um, we know that there are um, people that represent different, um, uh, very variable severity of the disease, and this is one of the aspects that we are working on, to try to figure out whether it is another um, gene that is maybe um, um, accompanied this effect, or whether it is an environmental effect. Um, so we are still working on this, but it's true. There is a very, like, uh, um, a lot of variability in terms of the severity of the disease. Were you asking if the mutation is always the same one in the gene? Okay, so that, um, it's a frame shift mutation. There can be many different uh, ways that you have the frame shift, but it's always the same frame shift. Does that help answer? So uh, in some patients, um, it is... Um, the mutation is found in something called the variable tandem repeat region of the gene. And so there are multiple repeats of the same. Um, um, and every patient, every, every human actually has, uh, every, every, every person has uh, uh, different numbers of these variable tandem repeats in their mucin 1 genes. So the mutation can be earlier on or later on as a single letter insertion, like a C insertion most, most uh, commonly, uh, that causes a frame shift. But sometimes you might have a deletion 
or um, uh, an insertion of a different letter, uh, like an A or a G we have found. Uh, but they all end up with the same frame shift, so the same frame shifted mutant protein is ultimately produced, no matter what the mutation is. And it's apparently always in the VNTR region as far as we have found so far. So it's uh, a lot of scientific jargon for those who are not in the field, but it is an interesting question. Other questions for any of our speakers? I know we have ran a little bit over. I just, uh, oh, yes. I want to introduce the uh, two directors of our new foundation. Oh, yes, please do. We have uh, Drew Ludlow, who's the president and co-founder of the uh, foundation. And some way, I got him to take 24 hours on a red eye to come here, because he's also the deputy campaign direct, director of the Mitt Romney for the United States Senate in our state of Utah, and then Cameron Nelson, uh, who I mentioned earlier, and my great mentor here, Ted Steinman. That's wonderful. It's ex exceptionally uh, good news, and uh, again, this partnership with patients is going to empower everything that we do. Any, yes? Let me just add one other. Yes. We have a very distinguished inventor, one of the most prolific <laughs> inventors in America, in really in the world here, Yes. Uh, who you can meet at the uh, reception. Uh, Dean Kamen, stand up and just uh, wave to everybody. <laughs> Dean Kamen is, uh, is well known for consumer uh, inventions like the Segway, but in our community, he's well known for being the inventor of uh, the peritoneal dialysis, one machine, the second machine, and now he's on the forefront worldwide of dealing with uh, taking hemodialysis to the world's most desperate uh, people that need uh, dialysis with the hemo home unit, not dialysis center, but taking it into the home so you get, anyway, it's a little bit of a commercial. Last comment. Thank you. Yeah, it's very Anna. good. It's a great and, honor to have you here. And last comment, he's, uh, he's, a f he's a mentor to the world in his first robotics and is going tomorrow to Mexico where he's rolling out the global first robotics. So thank you very much oh, for coming you. here. Thank you. And being with us. thank you. All right. Um, I think this concludes the formal part of our event. Uh, we're need, having a reception outside, so please uh, feel need, free need to, to uh, enjoy and mingle a little bit. Goes both ways. Uh, again, to remind you that we were celebrating yeah. International no, Rare Disease Day today, and it's been a great honor to have all the speakers here uh, representing not only our work in kidney disease, but also uh, work going on in progeria, Eller danlos syndrome, and other rare diseases through the Rare Diseases United Foundation. And most important, don't forget to admire the portraits that are um, on the wall here. Uh, the Beyond the Diagnosis exhibit. Thank you all for coming. See you next year.